My dad had a lot of trouble finding a job. He went from being a neurosurgeon and the head of the hospital in Guangzhou, China, to being a garbage man. And then eventually he couldn't find a job. And my mother went and she was an economics major in college, he went to clean hospitals for a living for over 30 years in order to support us and put food on the table. And so seeing my parents do that, and we came from pretty much nothing. We have very little. So when you have very little, you have very little to lose. And I call this the immigrant diet, right? You become your parents' protector and you translate for them. You take them to the doctors. You even help them to buy a house or negotiate to get a, a good deal on a car. And those are skills that people don't get to learn when they're that age. I got to learn them and I got to master those and it created this whole entrepreneurial spirit in me that I didn't know that to me came naturally, but it was really the environment that I was put in that shaped me and I have to be grateful for that. Hey friends, I'm your host Anya Smith. Today we're zeroing in on the magic of turning hurdles into victories and the vital role of sales in crafting successful entrepreneurial journey. Deep dive with us into a story of resilience, strategic growth, and the art of building genuine connections that fuel sustainable business success. From navigating the challenges of being a first-generation immigrant to making waves in the tech world with giants like IBM and Oracle, our guest brings a treasure trove of insights on transforming entrepreneurial dreams into reality. With a unique blend of expertise and a three-pronged strategy for success, Get ready for a conversation packed with actionable advice and inspiring tales. Let's warmly welcome Amy Lau. So excited to have you here. Oh, so excited to be here with you, Anya. Thanks for having me. Great to it see is you. My, it's great to see you as well. I know we've been planning for this for a little bit, but our schedules were a little bit conflicting. So we're making it happen, which is fantastic. Yay. So you are somebody who is who has been in this space for a while. You have so many experiences of you know, be creating your success. And for somebody who's maybe starting out in the digital landscape, how do you approach successful relationships that also drive sales? Coach successful relationship. Well, um, I, as an immigrant uh, coming to America when I was eight years old, I had to learn to adapt um, very quickly and make friends and learn English and just really change and adapt to a brand new culture. And so that has taught me a lot from an early age on how to build relationships. And, um, you know, not only that it made me into, uh, I, I felt like I was a people pleaser. However, um, people pleasing, um, you know, after you, you grow up and you learn to set your boundaries, um, it has a benefit of like really helping you to build relationships with people and earn their trust. And I say earn their trust because uh, when you first meet someone, uh, it, it takes a little bit of time of getting to know you, who you are. And I just love to uh, get to know people's stories and what they're about because uh, I came from a completely different background. Everybody has a, an amazing story that, uh, that they can tell. And when I teach people to build relationships, uh, that's where you start. Do not have an agenda when you go and meet someone. Uh, just be genuine, be authentic, be yourself, and everything will turn out great. And, and it could be that you're just connecting with somebody they may uh, not need your services at all or they may love it. Um, but your job at that point is to, to find that out. And if you don't have an agenda when you're meeting them, um, you're just building the relationship. That could turn into a lifelong friendship. That could turn into a lifelong client uh, or somebody that can connect you with someone. You never know who you're going to meet and come across. Absolutely. That's beautiful. And I'm curious for somebody who may be listening, maybe that sounds too easy, too good to be true. That it's just about, you know, having the relationships. What, what advice would you give people about being, not being gullible, perceived as gullible when you're just coming in with this soft approach or be, put another way, have you seen things go wrong? Like in people's common 
mistakes in the sales approach that don't help you have those productive relationships? Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> what I've seen and also, you know, I learned through failure. I've made a lot of mistakes myself. And when you first get into sales and they teach you sales 101 or nobody's taught you, you got to go out there and just trial and error. Uh, you make the mistake sometimes of, you know, you're so excited about your product or solution. You're telling people all about it, but you're not listening. <clears throat> you're not listening to what they have to say and what they really want. And so over the years, what I've learned for myself is to really truly listen to their stories and see if that's a good fit. Not everybody is the right fit. And as a salesperson, uh, one of the best things you could do for yourself is to find out all the no's, like have every rejection that you can find and and rule those out the people don't need you but other people do and so when one door closes another one opens you've heard the phrase if you're talking to somebody that does not really want to buy your services it's not a really good fit for them just move on as fast as you can so that you can get to the people who actually really need this okay. so in we talk about relationships and how important they are. And you mentioned a little bit earlier that so much of your experience as a first generation immigrant has shaped like how you approach relationships. You know, there's some things that um, maybe weren't working for us and we reflect on it. And for full transparency, I was also first gen I'm also a first generation immigrant. My mom came to the U S when I was seven, eight, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember learning English from TV, like going into first grade and not speaking the language. Um, and then in my situation, I actually, my, my parents moved to Spain a couple of years later. So I was again, learning a different language. And then they sent me back to school in Russia where I didn't like speak. I didn't read the language at fifth grade, but I had to like, catch up really quickly. Um, but I can really sense and relate to the sentiment of wanting to please others, especially when you come in, sur in surroundings where you're new, you're foreign, right? And you have to make connections. Like there's a sense of survival for me, it's mm -hmm. also maybe a sense like when you are somewhere with just your parents, you want, mm -hmm. you feel like the protection depends on you pleasing, keeping peace within the surrounding that you have. Um, and I know for me also, I had to read a book like Not Nice, which is about like not pleasing people to start reflecting mm -hmm. where this habit was not serving me. Uh, but can you talk about the subject of again, like where, like what important themes has being a first generation immigrant taught you and how can you apply that to business? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I value that you're an immigrant that came when you were seven or eight, around the same age that I came to America. Uh, when I was young, I thought life was just amazing because I was born into um, a family where the entire family lived together. My mommy, my uh, Baba, Apo, which is my grandma, um, uncles, aunts, all cousins, all lived under one roof. And, and I came from a culture where conformity was a key to survival. And then, uh, and in fact, standing out can be dangerous in, in that particular culture. And so when we came to the US, um, the survival really depends on your independence, right? And in the freedom, like you, all of a sudden we had all this freedom to be who we are and individually express ourselves. And so, uh, and I'm sorry, what was the question again in terms of the... Uh, uh, how has this experience, um, like what, what are some of the important things that maybe have taught you, that, what are some important learnings from this experience of being a first-generation immigrant? I know it's an ongoing thing uh, ah. that you can apply to business or your entrepreneurial journey. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, basically, as a as a first generation American, uh, we developed at a young age. Uh, I had a role reversal with my parents because suddenly, from them being my protector and taking care of me, we came to this country, and I had to learn English. So did they in their late thirties, and when. I, what I had to learn and, and study in school, they couldn't help me with homework, maybe math a little bit, but that's it. 
And so they, they had to learn a brand new culture and an older age. So to me, I, I'm grateful that I came when I was so young. My parents came so that they could create opportunities for my brother and I. And we came when we were very young, so we had you know, massive adaptability. And we grew a lot of resilience because we had to learn to make friends and, and build relationships at a young age in order to survive and thrive um, eventually. And then we had to pull our parents up um, with us. My dad had a lot of trouble um, finding a job. He was, he went from being a neurosurgeon and the head of the hospital in Guangzhou, China, to being a garbage man. He was a salesperson um, trying to sell jewelry. He did Amway. And then eventually he, he couldn't find a job. And my mother uh, went and she was an economics major in college. Mm -hmm. Uh, she went to clean hospitals for a living for over 30 years in order to support us and put food on the table. And so seeing my parents do that, um, and we came from pretty much nothing. We had very little. So when you have very little, you have very little to lose. And everything is up from there. So uh, it teaches you to be grateful for all of the things that you're given or um and, and I was tremendously lucky because at the time when I was young, uh, I was considered a minority in Seattle. And there were so many programs at school that were uh, an opportunity for a minority who is really good at academia. And so I got a lot of scholarships and opportunities to go to, um, you know, really great exploratory programs that really elevated me and set me up for success in the future. So I appreciate that um, being in this country. Um, and, and I call this kind of like the, the immigrant diet, right? Like you um, become your parents protector and you translate for them. You take them to the doctors. Um, you even help them to buy a house or negotiate to get a, a good deal on a car uh, for them. And those are skills that people don't get to learn when they're that age. Uh, but I got to learn them and I got to master those. And it created this whole entrepreneurial spirit in me that I didn't know, you know, that to me came naturally, but it was really the environment that I was put in that shaped me. And I have to be grateful for that. I love how beautiful the story is for many reasons, but the, the theme of you looking at it as this adversity with gratitude, like that, that's beautiful. So like people, you know, people can have the same experience, but their interpretation of it, their internalization of it can be very different. And yours so clearly leads to that resilience where you're saying, Hey, like I realize the reality of this challenge and I'm going to do everything I can to make the most of it, to grow from it, to be appreciative of the challenges that I had to overcome because in a way they also served me to where you are now. And how did you then find this path to like this natural path of entrepreneurship, you know, as a, as a kid growing up and then, you know, being this high achiever, how did you find this entrepreneurial path? Because I think the challenge also for high achievers like ourselves is to then say, like, okay, I know I'm, I know I'm smart and I can do a lot. But then it's easy to get on this track of like what I should be doing. How did you navigate that? When the, the importance of education and excelling at school was paramount to my culture. Uh, so the way that we advanced uh, to my parents, to my grandpa, like when I got my degree in college, my grandfather, my grandfather asked me, uh, why didn't you get your PhD? <laughs> so there's always this education that was very important. And that's the way out of the slums, out of the way, you know, um, where we, where we grew up that you can advance in your professional life. And so that was always instilled in me. I had it in my mind. I was a straight A student growing up because it was what was expected. And, um, and then I followed the path of what my parents thought um, as immigrants, 
you're a doctor or you're a lawyer, um, but you're never a salesperson, right? Um, you got to get a, like you're an engineer. Um, so that's, that's what was instilled in me. And so I always um, follow that corporate America path where um, I went and got a job and then I was hoping to be promoted and, and continue up this track of corporate. But I hit up a lot of obstacles along the way because of my personality, because I learned all of these things and, and developed some grit when I was young. And I was very independent because I had to learn, um, you know, to fend for myself and, and so forth. And when you are in a corporate environment, what I learned was that it, it doesn't fit everybody. And it didn't fit me because when I had ideas, some people would squash them and say, well, that's, uh, you know, that's nice, but we do things this way here. And so you have to train to do things this way. And so I hit up against that maybe one too many times where I thought, you know what, I don't know if this is the right fit for me. And that started me on my entrepreneurial journey because it's not that I didn't have a choice, but, uh, all of the situations, like when you get a nudge from the universe of things that did not go right and you fail at it, that is the nudge for me that, okay, we need to pivot now and go in a different direction. And being an immigrant, um, it helped me to adapt in that way and very quickly. So fail and fail fast and fail often because you never learn from your successes. If you're always successful, how would you ever learn from it? It's only when I failed that I had to go, you know, I fell down, had to go and get myself back up somehow, and I had to move on and, and ascend. And even in my entrepreneurial journey, I also had a few iterations of that. When I first started, I wanted to, uh, coach people. I thought I could do sales training because I am, you know, good in, in, in sales. But when I went to companies, I found out that small business, they don't have the budget to be able to afford an outside sales team. So you end up having to work for the company in order to get there. And so this is the third iteration of entrepreneurship. And I would like to say thank you that People, uh, it's a very romantic story, you know, perpetuate like, and, and, you know, uh, go after your dreams and, and follow your passion. And that's a very romantic story. But the reality of it is that when you go after your dreams and you, you follow that path, um, you had one job before you came. And then all of a sudden you have all of the jobs, like you're your secretary, you have <laughs> You also have to uh, make sure that you're charging enough to pay your bills, um, especially your medical um, in this country. You have to pay your medical insurance and, and factor all of that into uh, the, the client relationships that you have. And so you, you sort of have to look backwards at um, the structure and then how to make sure that you are paying yourself enough to live and being able to reinvest back in your business. And then how do you scale from there? So um, all of those things I learned from trial and error and a couple of iterations of that, while it's romantic to start your own business and, and follow your dreams, um, take the calculated risk, be prepared, take a year's salary and have that ready and going. And a lot of people, if you can do it, um, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who hold nine to five jobs and then from five to nine, they're working on their own business. And, and that's while holding a family. So that's a lot, you know, and, and so be prepared for having to go through some of these hurdles and overcoming obstacles, adapt to them, and then at the end, you can, um, really not the end, in the middle of it, you can start enjoying some of the fruits of your labor. But it is hard work. 
<laughs> Absolutely. It's not quite as pretty on the inside. <laughs> There's a lot more uh, behind that. And we talked about expectations about your family and being immigrant, that there are certain path that said like, okay, this is what we value. This is what we see. You know, this is what we want you to do and conform to. And you definitely went off. So I'm curious, what were some of the biggest challenges you had to overcome, whether it's internal or external on this entrepreneur journey? I'm making the assumption that there would be some cultural ones as well with like being a first generation immigrant, oh. uh, but would love to hear from you. Yes. Um, and in fact, I did go to law school and I, I ha because, you know, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor or you're an engineer <laughs> in right, my culture. Right. And those are the, the meters of success. And so nobody understands. Like to this day, I have a hard time explaining to my parents what I am doing <laughs> in terms of my profession. It's not categorized. And so, yes, uh, we run into a lot of the, the cultural obstacles from the older generation of my parents where they don't understand it. And they, they think security is the key. Coming here, uh, job security is the number one key to survival and being happy. And, uh, and so uh, when you are not a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, um, then they, my parents worry about me quite a bit. I get a call like, oh, what are you doing these days? Oh, do you <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also um, a divorcee. So when I was single, my parents also called me and said, you know, do you have a partner? Because oh. in their mind, you have somebody taking care of you. Do you have, you know, job security? Um, is, is your life all set? So that's what they want to see. But, uh, and I, I explained to them that, hey, you know, uh, this is actually okay because I can take care of myself. And in terms of a job or um, having your own business, money can come from anywhere. Abundance can come from anywhere. And you never know when you help somebody uh, it could lead to another opportunity. And so I have been very fortunate to be inviting opportunities wherever I go. People ask me, what's your job search strategy? And my job search strategy has been, I don't have a job search strategy. <laughs> the, the strategy is to really be yourself and, and understand who you are and what your value is that you can deliver and be true to that because then you're going to automatically invite to you the, the people who are aligned with that value and who are looking for that. And so all my life, I found that when I was unstable, like I didn't have a job, uh, opportunities always found themselves to me and I could pick and choose. I chose a lot of the wrong opportunities as well. And it was only, and I'm grateful for that because it was only in choosing the wrong path that I could get to where I am today, finding the right path and the, the right family situation and, and just being happy. Happiness is an action. It's a choice. Absolutely. And now you're, you're leading the wow factor. And I'm curious, what kept you going? So here, you know, you talk about that everything's happening for you and there's a sense of resilience, but I'm sure there are really hard moments, right? You said this is your third, third entrepreneurial journey. You're also going in some way against cultural expectations. Your parents are reaching out to you with those calls, you know, loving, but concerned. <laughs> what keeps you going on this journey? Well, what motivates me and keeps me going every day is just life itself. Like every day, you never know what to expect. And if when you're comfortable with changing and you know that you can adapt and that you can, you have the ability to figure things out, um, no matter what situation you're in, when you fell down as many times as I have and you had to get back up, you learn that it's not so hard to get back up and it's just part of life. And we all go through it. Everybody has their challenges. Um, and 
and there are times when you win. And so nothing is ever the same. And if you can accept that and, and just flow with it, um, then you are, I would consider myself to be in the flow um, and just really listening to people. Sales, uh, which I believe is my most important life skill, um, was developed. My sales skills were developed with my skills of learning people and understanding people's stories. And in them telling me their stories, I learned who they are, what drives people. And then I also uh, reflected on that and, and learned who I was. And I think that is, you know, building resilience is about knowing the foundation of who you are and staying with that and staying true to yourself. And that's beautiful. And can you give any practical advice, like maybe one or two pieces of advice that work for you to help like being true to yourself or even identify what is true to myself? Yeah. Yes. Um, I actually wrote this down. Give me a, can you start? Please. You're good. You're, okay. There's no rush. Okay. okay. So what the question is, what is true to yourself? Yeah. What is true to yourself? And any advice for somebody to practically do, I'll even figure out what is true to them. Um, well, so what is true to myself is that I'm a person who uh, tried for many years into this corporate uh, lifestyle and corporate journey and, and then discovered that that is not for me and that I, and I'm an entrepreneur with my own ideas and innovation, and I have to follow my own path. And so I resisted that for many years, which made me very unhappy. <laughs> and, and then finally, I accepted who I was. And so self-acceptance is a, a key to that. And once you accept who you are, and, and once you learn who you are, and you accept who you are, then you can go on that path of um, being that. And the world needs that from you. Mm -hmm. It needs you to express yourself as truly who you are. And that actually is your contribution. Or to me, that's, that's my contribution into the world is being myself. And, um, and then once you have that contribution into the world, then people can you know, really benefit from that contribution. And then maybe they can be inspired to be who they are. Um, okay. So adapting to things and really listening for the signs. If something isn't working out, try like don't push and, and force yourself into a situation where you think that is the path. There is no script. There is no written way of how to be in this world. Uh, we each can, you know, create our own path of happiness. And so I think it's very important to follow that individually. Um, yeah. Beautiful. It, it's funny, uh, right now, well, throughout this whole entrepreneurial journey, I never realized what an inner journey entrepreneurship is. And to your description, mm -hmm. like the tides and the waves, like when you are in a company, you're somewhat somewhat shielded from that right you kind of assume like this is kind of the current i'm gonna be on because i you know somebody else is laying down the ground rules but in a way like you're a current that has a very set direction and you can't really go outside of that but then when you're on a road you kind of like come out to the ocean and now you have <laughs> all of these tides and waves right but you also have this vaster vaster space where you can decide the direction of where you want to go but you also have to be mindful of, you know, like listening to the tides and the waves and some of the natural things that are happening to, so you're not forcing yourself against the current all the time and exhausting yourself. So I like the, the analogy of water. And it's interesting, I'm teaching this accelerated course for entrepreneurs, and a lot of it is internal focus because I think people mm -hmm. underestimate how much internal how internal the work of entrepreneurship is again, like things that get you to succeed or not, are not going to be just what your strategy is or having the best pitch, mm -hmm. or it's going to be about like, what's inside you. What are you telling yourself that's limiting you? Are you able to listen to your inner guidance? 
and some mm-hmm. people may say that's woo woo, but that's really the case. Like so much of what we achieve in life is based on our beliefs, our inner work, our, our relationship to the higher things that we believe in that drive us or give us inspiration and resilience. So um, I love that you bring it up about like what keeps you going is that the in, inner understanding that the mm-hmm. reflection that you have with yourself of like what's serving me, what's not serving me, this environment, this role, you know, like my own inner practices and being true to that. That's really cool. And I'm curious now that, you know, you, you had, you know, your third effort, what are you most excited about, about the wow factor? Like what's unique and what are you most proud of, of the wow factor? Oh, thank you. Um, I mean, going back to the, the inner journey that you described, I want to add that I had a lot of help, uh, from people that, and, um, a lot of friendships and experiences and people guiding me enemies are also, um, very welcome because, you know, you don't get through life without making a few enemies and, and they actually teach you <laughs> a lot as well. And so I, I appreciate all of those um, and, and that, you know, the interaction with the outside world um, put me into an inner journey that um, I had to go through this trial uh, by fire that I, and in fact, I did walk on hot coals and, and challenge myself beyond what I thought was possible for me. And I felt super empowered um, from that. So every once in a while, I would say, challenge yourself to do something that is hard, something that you were scared of. And, uh, but do it safely, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so what am I most excited about? Um, well, the wow factor has evolved to include my um, husband um, and partner. So uh, what my, our business model is the three-legged, uh, the, the three-legged approach to business, which is innovation, sales, and financial strategy. So to start a business, you need a good idea, which is innovation, and then a plan for selling that idea, right? So you need innovation and sales, but then you need to make sure that it's profitable and in so that you can earn a living and reinvest back into your business to grow and and to scale etc so we're very excited to bring on the new iteration of the wow factor uh with my husband igor goldberg um and uh together we're really fortunate to have <clears throat> clients that are looking to us um to help them to grow their business and to uh, and in, in this day and age with AI and all of the new technologies, um, I, I truly believe that, you know, we chose to be here um, and, and live here in a time of innovation and so much techn- technological advancement that we can really take advantage of that and harness those tools in order to help us to grow and, and be more and, and, and contribute more in the world. and and um and live together um more peacefully and so i love good business and um people who are out there you know adding value in the world we want to help them to add more value in the world we want to help them live a life of joy um contributing uh, who they are so that's i love that there's a balance I, I was gonna say I love that there's a balanced approach to it because to your point, like you can be excited about something, you can have a strategy, but it also has to be something that's sustainable, right? So there's has to be like this balance of what you put in, what you get out, and that there's a sustainable relationship between those areas. So awesome. Yes. And um I want to also just wrap up and ask like if somebody wants to work with you, where should like what resources should they explore? Where can they find you? And if you also want to mention you have an upcoming TED talk coming up, so I'd love to oh, hear yeah. also about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. If somebody wants to work with me, absolutely. I'd be delighted to have a conversation um, on my website. I think you're going to include in it, it's the wow factor spelled W A U factor USA.com. And uh, I can also be reached on LinkedIn um, as well. And uh, my upcoming Ted talk is going to be in Wilmington, Delaware, April 27th. Um, yeah, I'd love for you to come if you can. And um, it's going to be, I'm going to talk about 
um, going from conformity to individual purpose, which is uh, if there was one thing that I would love to share in the world, and that is if everybody can find and, and live in their individual purpose, that is going to really delight the world and help us to all be elevated. So beautiful. Beautiful. I cannot wait. It's going to be amazing. And so aligns with what we're doing here right off track, where people want people to inspire to pursue their own purpose, especially through entrepreneurship. So we are, we're way aligned on that. And I love that our paths are crossing around this. Okay. So here, right off track, we wrap up with three rapid fire questions. So whenever you're ready, let me know. Sure. Okay. So best advice received from a mentor. Best advice received from a mentor. Wow. Um, listen. The best advice that I've received from a mentor is to really listen to people uh, and listen to their stories. And in that, you find the magic and you build that relationship that could turn into something really meaningful and magical for everyone to, to listen. Good advice for all of us. Okay. The most surprising lesson learned from a failure. Um, well, when I was, uh, when I was young, I had an opportunity to go um, back to China and work in Beijing and I was negotiating uh, for a little bit of higher salary, just a few thousand dollars, not much. Yeah. And uh, I was turned down after I was chosen because there was a line of people waiting for that opportunity that would take it as is. And I was, um, I guess, seen as I'm not grateful for, <laughs> for the yeah. salary that, was, uh, that I was trying to negotiate. And I didn't know how to negotiate at that time. And I was, I actually really was crying for days because I really wanted this opportunity to go um, to, to China and, and work there. But now looking back on it, I'm glad I stayed in the US and I had a lot more in the past for me uh, in the US. Uh, and, and I don't, think I would have really enjoyed that experience. I think it was rejection is protection. And I really, truly believe that. And so the path that I'm on is the right path for me. And the mistakes that I made, um, those are gold because they are the the learning ground for me to really grow and develop as the human being that I am. So as I said earlier, you don't learn from successes, <laughs> you learn from your failures. And, and so that's the most surprising lesson is that you just have to fail and fail often. And I look to my higher being and I ask when I, you know, even before this talk, uh, how can I serve uh, this community? What, what message needs to come from me that maybe somebody out there needs to hear? And so, um, so to me, I'm just a vehicle that is here for messages to come through me um, into the world. And, and if I can serve, I'm like, it makes me so happy to be that. It's beautiful. And I love the example because it again shows that you were never conforming. Even in that example, when you were young, you're like, nope, <laughs> the natural sense is like, nope, I'm not going to do it. Even though you were yeah. upset, you know, logically, there was an internal just vehicle inside you already kind of like, no, I'm going to do things my way. So I love it. Okay. Last but not least, in the positive sense, going off track is. So going off track to me is following the beat of your own drum. And don't let people tell you who you are. Find out for yourself. Get curious. When something hits up that doesn't sound right, get curious. Don't get angry. I was telling my friend, don't get mad, get even. And to me, get even is, hey, if somebody is like beating you down and, and you don't like it or bullying you, then stand back up and show them what you're really made of. And that's really getting even is 
is like being who you are. <laughs> I love it. Amy, thank you so much for this beautiful reminder for us to be ourselves, no matter if you are a first generation immigrant or not at all, but you are in a path where maybe it doesn't feel like it's right for you. So I hope this could be an inspiration for all of our listeners and myself to reflect on like what is serving us, what's not, what's truly us. And how can we also genuinely serve the people in the best way possible? And that the only way we can show up in our unique capacity. And again, like be true to yourself, listen to the guidance inside you and don't let the guidance externally overpower that voice. So, so many beautiful lessons that I took away. And as a listener, please let me know what stood out to you. Share us with a friend who might benefit from as well. And as always, Thank you so much for coming off track and let's take over the world together right off track until next time. And thank you, Amy. This was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. I have a pleasure working with you.